for doing Ruby stuff with Ida. So, sort of, um, so who am I? Um, I used to work on Metasploit, and uh, uh, that's pretty much my only famous. Um, and yeah. So before we get started, I'd also like to thank Scape uh, for helping with the original design of IDARUB, and then everybody else who helped test it and gave feedback and stuff. And everybody who made TourCom possible. So, so, um, so what is IDARUB? Um, or how many people here have even really, how many people here use IDA on a regular basis? That's pretty good. Um, so, uh, IDARUB's pretty simple. It's just a IDA uh, an IDA plugin that embeds the Ruby interpreter into IDA and then allows um, access to the IDA SDK uh, from, sorry, uh, from Ruby. So you can't really add anything that's not already in IDA, it's just making it more convenient. And then the one thing it does do is expose it remotely, which I'll talk about. So um, the original plan was try to build like a, a friendlier SDK, um, but I haven't really done that yet, so. Anyway. So, the first thing people are gonna ask is like, you know, there's already Ida Python, so why even care about doing Ruby? Um, Python is really good, and I looked at it a lot when I was working on Ida Ruby. Um, but, <laughs> I was just sort of doing this for fun, and I wanted to write in Ruby, so, I, and I wanted just to, to write this. Um, and, when we figured out how to do the network model um, and the interactive model, which I think is really important, um, and it's actually probably one of the most valuable pieces about it, uh, and I only knew how to do it for Ruby, so um, instead of trying to make Ida Python do the same thing, um, I just did it all in Ruby, and it wasn't that hard, so. Um, also, we have a lot of other tools that we've written in Ruby, so it would be nice if we could like have a common ground. Um, but I guess all of the reverse engineering stuff is happening in Python now, so maybe it's a bad idea. But um, Also, the plugin itself is probably a good example for how to write IDA plugins that um, act asynchronously. So one of the biggest problems with IDA that I'll talk about is that it's all single-threaded, so if you want to have any sort of interactive plugins and stuff like that, um, you have to do some tricks. So, so I'm kind of hung over. <laughs> and, th and this is really boring talk, sorry. Um, so yeah, another thing is um, I have swig wrappers that I wrote that should be, um, I tried to keep the Ruby specific aspects of it as small as possible. So if you wanted to use the same wrappings to wrap the SDK in Python or like Tickle or something, good. Um, so even if you don't care about Ruby at all, um, there might be some useful pieces outside of that, the swig wrappings and the plugins and stuff like that. Um, so like, what were the original goals? Um, so I didn't, so if anybody's written IDC, you know it's kind of like a bad language. Um, and so I guess the goal was to get rid of IDC for like simple stuff. Um, and there's no to ever try to replace like full normal plugins. Um, and the actual, the most useful thing I found with Ida Rub is just being able to interactively um, sort of play with Ida and figure stuff out. So um, I actually find myself using it a lot to prototype a plugin that I'll write in C or something. So I'll basically prototype it out in Ruby or sit in an interactive prompt and sort of figure out like what steps I'm going to go through and then write the whole thing in C. So it's useful for that. Um, yeah. So uh, one interesting thing about Ida Python is they have this big um, IDC compatibility layer. So basically all the functions that you find in IDC are re-implemented in Ida Python. So it's pretty easy to port code that was in IDC to Ida Python. Um, although this is like like 8,000 lines of Python or something to have this compatibility interface. Um, and that's just a lot of work that I didn't want to do, so I don't have anything like that. Um, so the technical details of works is kind of um, just engineering nitty gritty details, but that's what I'm gonna spend the beginning of this talking about. So um, it's gonna be kind of boring, but I guess it's uh, good to know. Um, also, um, yeah, <laughs> um, the IDA was very difficult. I found a lot of IDA bugs and stuff while working on this. Um, so it was basically like the, the concept of this is really cool, 
then actually making everything work was really complicated because it's just kind of a mess. But anyway. Um, so if we want to access, so people who don't know, IDA is a disassembler and they have a C++ um, API to allow you to automate stuff like add comments and do disassembly and all sorts of stuff. Um, so if we want to access this from a higher level language, we need some sort of uh, wrapper from the high level language to map the C++ interface. So you could even, um, you could either write this by hand, which some people um, do, or there's this tool called Swig. Um, and the nice thing about Swig is at least conceptually, it tries to be decoupled from the language that you're wrapping it to. So you can write Swig bindings, and then you could use it from like Ruby, TCL, Python, blah, 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 blah. Um, and it's a lot quicker to do. Um, although there was a lot of Swig bugs that I dealt with too and stuff. Um, I have to set my like generated code right now and search and replace stuff to make it compile. But anyway, um, so one of the things that I did differently than Ida Python because Ida Python also used Swig, um, but what they did is they modified all of the um, they modified all of the Ida headers so that they would both compile and and they used them to run Swig over them. Um, so you have all of these headers that were sort of be like if def Swig. Um, <laughs> And uh, so, can you, uh, like, uh, anyway. Um, the light's like right in my eyes. Uh, yeah, I can't see it all. <laughs> um, so, so basically what I did is I just took two sets of headers. I had one set of headers that I was gonna run Swig over. And since there's a lot of um, functions that Swig not, might not be able to wrap and stuff, I just completely modified that set. So I say like, okay, I don't need this function header up, I'll just remove it from the headers. Um, so I basically had a cleaned up set of headers that I ran swig over to generate the wrappers, and then I had the normal unmodified headers that I actually build against. Um, so stuff that I can't do with swig right now. Um, number one, Ida uses the same set of headers for both the public interface and for, in, for their internal interface. So there's uh, functions in the header, headers that aren't actually exported in the DLLs. So swig will try to generate wrapper code for that, and then it will be referencing uh, function. So you have to remove any non-exported data or functions. Um, right now I also don't support callbacks, so anything that takes function pointers, um, so a lot of like the user interface functions and stuff like that. So you have to remove any functions with callbacks, and then there's some other little things you have to fix up, um, like defines and stuff like that. Um, so then the way Swig works is you end up writing these things called type maps, which are basically sort of pattern matching on the prototypes of the functions that you're trying to wrap and then you can translate those into specific things. Um, so I had to do a lot of specific stuff for IDA because if you just look at a C API, it's not clear like what's an input argument, what's an output argument, and stuff like that. So there's a lot of um, targeted stuff. But in total, it was only 128 lines of Swig definition, so it's not too bad. Um, and for a lot of the stuff, Swig is sort of um, a pain to work with. So I tried to defer most of the, uh, I tried to defer a lot of stuff just to doing it in Ruby. So be like, okay, I'm gonna wrap this function and it's gonna be kind of lazy and it's not like, you're gonna have to fix up the return values afterwards. But I'll just do that in Ruby instead of doing it in Swig. Um, so then the actual part about embedding Ruby. Um, so in order to do this, um, so I wanted to support both executing scripts locally inside of IDA and remotely. So I just embedded a Ruby interpreter inside of an IDA plugin. Um, and there was a lot of uh, tricky details about this, but. So, um, so the way it works is the plugin dynamically links against uh, the Ruby DLL, so you need a normal Ruby installation, but then that's it. And then uh, the Ruby interpreter gets loaded uh, the first time the plugin gets initialized, and then it just stays loaded. Um, so the way Swig generally works is it's made to compile uh, loadable modules, so you usually like compile like a .so or a .dll. Um, so basically I took just the Swig generated code that would normally be a DLL, and I just compile it in into the plugin. So you just have one uh, DLL that has everything. So there's an IDA plugin with Ruby embedded, and then it has the Swig bindings um, also embedded. Um, and then if you just wanted to do local mode, this would be all that you need. So this is basically what IDA Python is. It's just um, an IDA plugin with a Python interpreter and then Swig bindings. So um, local mode's pretty straightforward. And I thought the coolest thing about this, and I 
project if we hadn't gotten to work was the, uh, the network access. So uh, basically what we did is um, you basically write a little RPC mechanism to access the SDK from outside of um, IDA. So there's something in Ruby called DRB, Distributed Ruby, and originally I tried that um, just to create like a RPC mechanism. But um, there was tons of crazy problems with it. So I just wrote, it's convenient because since we're swig wrapping stuff, we basically know all of the, the, the types that we're gonna be calling into functions are gonna be really simple. Like I'm not gonna have like an array of hashes of, you know, hashes of arrays or something like that because I'm only calling C functions. So the mapping is pretty much like very simple. So I could write a very simple RPC layer just to marshal all the arguments because none of them were complex. Um, so then I actually just write um, a bunch of Ruby code and then I just the string and put it in the actual C++ code. Um, so the Ruby code for the RPC server is just also embedded in the plugin. Um, and then the, the C code for the plugin is very thin, pretty much defers all of the work into the Ruby, Ruby part which makes things pretty simple. Um, so then you just loop this and you would have remote SDK access, but you wouldn't be able to use IDA at the same time. Um, so this would basically be like, you'd have a server that would be non-functional um, and it would just allow IDA access. Um, so uh, doing the RPC part in Ruby is fairly simple because it's a dynamically typed language and it has built in like marshalling and stuff like that. So you can just sort of say, okay, I have this object, now I want a string representation of it, and I'm gonna send it over the network and then unmarshal it on the other end. Um, although, when you mix in the swig uh, objects, it gets a lot more interesting. The swig objects are these lightweight C++ objects that get wrapped into Ruby, and then they basically just wrap like a pointer to an IDA object. Um, so this isn't information that you could send across. Um, because it's all wrapping C++ data structures. So Ruby has no way of being able to inspect uh, that object and like serialize it and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, the RPC mechanism is just very simple. Like you send a request to call an API and you get the response to the return value. Um, so another concept that I stole from DRB is the idea of a front object, which is just um, when you initially connect to the RPC server, you need something to start calling methods on so you get an initial object called the front object. Um, so this is the starting point to call any methods. Um, so basically the way the protocol works is pretty simple. I just send an array that, uh, over an array on the network, which is um, the object that I'm gonna call method on, the name of the method, and then any args. And then uh, I just get the return values back. And if there's any uh, exception thrown, I catch the exception and send that back to you. So it's pretty cool. Um, so you could support callbacks, although it makes things a lot more complicated. And um, the only things I initially looked at that needed callbacks were user interface code. And I figured if you were writing remote scripts in Ruby, there's no need to be using that um, user interface. So I didn't support callbacks at all. Okay. So one other engineering detail. Um, so there's some objects that you can marshal easy and make sense on the client side. So for example, say I call an IDA function and it returns a string. Um, I can just send over all of the data for that string and it makes complete sense to the client. So primitives, strings, integers, exceptions, um, these are all easy to marshal and they make perfect sense.